Thanks, everyone, for coming today, especially in this uh, late time slot. So hopefully we'll get you in and out in time for dinner. My name's Ken Robbins, and I run engineering at the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research, also known as NIBR. And with me today is Nathan Wallace, who is the founder and CEO of Turbot. Let me start by giving a little bit of context into what we do at NIBR uh, to motivate what we're talking about and how we manage uh, policy controls in the cloud. So uh, NIBR is the research arm of Novartis. So we deal with early drug discovery all the way up through phase one clinical trials. And as you can see, there's a lot of scientists, projects, disease areas, scientific platforms, a lot of complexity, a lot of different systems at different scales. And as you know, in science, it changes fast, and it's constantly changing. And so that's the uh, informatics landscape that we need to keep up with. Equally complex is our technical landscape. Technical diversity, of course, is also changing very quickly. And we have lots of engineers and informaticians. Uh, we have cloud apps, on-prem, a lot of variety there. Uh, bleeding edge new stuff as well, some really old legacy things as well. So our main challenge is that we have to figure out how are we going to keep up with the science and accelerate drug discovery in the face of this constant change, high complexity, high diversity, uh, but we also have to keep control, compliance, security, monitoring of all this at the same time. So we've been using the cloud since, let's say, 2010, but generally in a very homogeneous way. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started to build our new cloud strategy, which is really to shift to the cloud in, in a serious way. And one of the first things we did as we figured out what that strategy was going to be is we looked at this diversity and, and the landscape that we had to manage. And it was pretty obvious that we're going to have this order end problem. We're going to hand to mouth have to be managing individual applications, and that was going to be challenging. So one of the first things we did is we clustered our applications into six fundamental use cases. These were what makes sense for us. You probably might have same, similar overlaps with your own, but with some differences as well. But for us, these were the six use cases that mattered. And the characteristic uh, clustering criteria is there's, for each of these, there's a unique functional template or blueprint, as well as a control requirement. The pair of those things together describe or define each of these uh, boundaries around these use cases. So maybe what I'll do is I'll walk through some of these just to give a little bit of a flavor of what they are, but also so you can see how we divide them. So the first we start off with is this thing called Tech Labs. This is our cloud sandboxes. This is where a um, informatician or engineer, anyone who just go into Amazon and do kind of whatever they want. This is where we transform the organization by giving people a place to explore and learn Amazon, download open source software, write new algorithms, whatever you might want to do. We give very little friction there, high freedom. But in exchange, we say that's only for public data. You can't use any of our private data there. So very few controls, limited on what data. And it's really firewalled off almost entirely from the rest of the network. So that's why it's safe to do that. So that's one sort of pattern. Next, we have this informatics labs. This is where our informaticians and our data scientists will operate. Again, very much like a tech lab, the sort of ad hoc workloads. But in this case, they need access to our entire data ecosystem. And so we have to have more controls, because now we're opening up the network. And so there's a different shape uh, for what those controls are. And that's unique for that particular use case, or class of use cases. Then we have uh, applications and services. This is a more traditional infrastructure as a service. And this is where you'll have your web applications, uh, web services, data platforms, things that are on infrastructure that's long running. So you can imagine there's uh, this servers that are running for a long time that need to be patched. Um, there's access controls and security groups. It's just a different shape and, and sort of control and compliance profile versus some of these other use cases. Uh, and this is, in fact, where we spend most of our time, at least in terms of numbers of use cases. Uh, maybe one more here. Um, external partner collaboration is another important uh, and, and, again, unique uh, profile. This is where, um, so over the last couple of years in particular, NIBR has shifted our focus to uh, what we call opening the framework, 
where we're accelerating and amplifying the amount of uh, external collaborations that we do with academia and industry partners. And so we need a place and a way to do that when those uh, collaborations have an informatics content, which of course is always. So, these, um, so we have this uh, environment for external partner collaboration where we have to be able to handle the control and compliance as well as the data sharing uh, uh, in this kind of common environment, which is, again, very different from some of these other use cases. We also have distributed computing. We have a, a robust internal HPC environment, but we also burst that out to the cloud. Again, different so, sort of model there. Um, also, we have non-Amazon, basically anything software as a service, platforms as a service, uh, we need to manage those as well, and that's just, you know, it's more vendor management than it is infrastructure management. So those are basically our, our the use cases and the clustering that we did. And by coming up with this clustered pattern, we can apply template so we don't have to do everything across um, every possible uh, combination of, of workload. So after we have our requirements, then we have to figure out what is it we're going, how, how are we going to build this? How are we going to satisfy these needs? So of course, one of the very early architectural decisions we had to make was, uh, what is our account model? Are we going to have one big single account, or maybe a small number, uh, or a lot of accounts. We're really excited and interested in this idea of using a multi-account model, because that gave us a really good boundary, which seemed to make sense for this diversity of workloads that we have. But like I said, we were in the cloud for a while in a very homogeneous sort of way, and it was really hurt our heads to try to figure, at least it hurt mine, how are we going to manage policy control and compliance and monitoring and know what's going on, which we have a responsibility to do, across a vast number of accounts. It just seemed like a silly thing to even contemplate. And so really by inspection, we didn't even run many experiments on this, we pretty much said, that, yeah, let's not do that. So instead, we opted for the single account model because that seemed understandable and manageable and sure, we could handle that. So I use this picture here of this uh, large restaurant to be the model for what I'm talking about when I say single account model. In our case, we start off with a few accounts. You might have like dev, test, prod, as separate accounts, GXP, non-GXP, that sort of kind of uh, separation. Still, it's a handful. But in any one account is a pool of many different workloads, just like you have many different tables here. So you have this common environment that people need to sort of separate from each other, but they still could bump into each other. You have a common kitchen, which has a fixed menu. Uh, it doesn't change very fast. It's really hard to accommodate a lot of different menus with one kitchen. And then in order to get something from the kitchen, you have to use these black vested waiters to go into the kitchen for you. You can't have a shared environment and have everybody be autonomously writing their own IAM controls. Well, and that's when we start to find some breaks in this model. As we started to build out, we went for this model, and we started to build out a few workloads and a few more. We recognized very quickly we were starting to bottleneck because we had to control the gate of who's going to write IAM. And every time the new workload came in, the team building that workload really couldn't write their own IAM policy because that's really got to be the centralized service, just like the waiters going into the kitchen. And then there were some other issues. You have, we created some tagging standards, but now how you enforce tagging? Now you have to start forcing people into some automation models to make sure you get the tagging right. The whole thing, without going into too many details, as we started to scale, we could see the cracks in the model and realize that at the kind of scale we thought with the number of diverse workloads we have, you notice I showed before we had 400 internal applications running today, um, how are we going to do that when we go to the cloud? It just seemed like this was not going to work. And while we're scared about our ability to manage that, we recognized that it was better to lean into that and figure out how are we going to automate and solve that problem uh, because Doing it in the single account model um, was just too brittle, wouldn't work. So in good lean style, we stopped, we shifted and pivoted into a multi-account model. So here I got, again, I shouldn't be talking about food before dinner in a late session, but um, we've got a, another food uh, example. This is a food court um, in the Venetian, actually, but this one's in Macau because they had better pictures. And so in our multi-account model here, it's just like each one of these restaurants. Each restaurant has their own menu with many items on it, but each cuisine is very different. Its own autonomous team uh, and staff, access, food supply. They have some shared services across plumbing and electricity, let's say, but otherwise, they're all independent. So now shifting back to the cloud, how does that work with 
multi-account and what it meant for us. So by using this, what we call uh, an account as a container model, I can get this high diversity that we know we need. Just like you have each restaurant has a new style um, cuisine comes in, they can just build a new restaurant. We can just create a new account every time. So uh, we can accommodate that diversity without, ha it's always this, this clean separation. Now, if I have the separate account, it's very easy to give autonomy. I can give it a team, here's your account, you can go work in there and get some stuff done and focus on, on the results and not be worried, so much worried about making sure that your boundaries are clean. Another element which is actually easy to overlook and is the, um, you get unique limits with an account. Uh, you probably know Amazon has hard limits on, uh, on all the resources, but of course there's also soft limits on just about any resource that you might consume. These are done at the account level, right? So that means if I have a shared account and I have one workload using 60% of my resources and another workload using 60% of my resources, they're both causing each other to be throttled, and no one knows why, because each one is under the limit. Well, what if I now have dozens of workloads all using the same resource? Now, the best thing you could do there is increase all your limits to the max, which is kind of like putting a 500 amp fuse in your kitchen circuit. It's just, that's not why we have limits. So, so limit um, ability to do at the account level helps when you're working with uh, workloads per account. And of course, with the separate accounts, I can also now give access control per workload, per that vertical slice of what it is you're trying to do, who should have access, as opposed to more of an infrastructure uh, model where it's maybe sliced across your role in the organization. You have access to servers, you have access to hardware, to application or middleware. You know, now I can slice vertically, which is actually really powerful and empowering, because I can give exactly the right access to who should have access to which application, depending on what... Uh, its needs and, and control requirements may be. And of course, the obvious one is you get this limited blast radius. When you have a fixed account boundary, generally the worst that can happen is something within that account, uh, whether it's uh, a hack or maybe someone runs some automation that decides that they should sort of delete all your EC2s, but it goes amok because you have a one-off error, um, then you know, it's nice to have the account boundary to limit your, uh, your damage risk. And of course, cost management is really important. We don't talk a lot about cost because we're moving to the cloud for agility. We actually do save money, but we try not to focus too much on cost. But if you're not careful, of course, you know, it can grow up really fast. By having individual accounts, each account sees their own invoice without tagging, which is really powerful. You can just see exactly what you're spending and the breakdown across resources without doing anything at all. Amazon gives that to you for free. You can always aggregate things back up if you want. It's just hard to break them down. So the account, the breakdown of having a separate account is really powerful in that way. Uh, and of course, then you can also do something, uh, if you own an account, you can set a billing alarm because you know what makes sense for your workload. It's, it's, um, lo everything's localized. And you know, again, when you're in this larger environment, it's hard to do that. So just looking back for a moment on these use cases again, just to remind you, what we had, and I'd like to show how we take these use cases and we, multi, we map that to a multi-account uh, model. And what we, like I said before, we have the notion of a template which applies to both the function as well as the policy um, pattern that we're applying. So here's what a multi-account model looks like at NIVR. And I'll start with these uh, tech labs that I mentioned. So for the tech labs, we have about 30 different accounts. Each is generally organized around the boundary of a um, of a department or a group, and maybe about five to 15 different individuals work in that account. There's a template that says how to build one of these, just a, a blueprint we can just run uh, to create some, uh, a tech lab, and although once we built out a bunch, we don't uh, grow them too quickly. Uh, and then there's a set of policy controls that apply to all the tech labs. So each one that exists, I don't have to do anything new, I just say, oh, it's a tech lab, therefore it gets this policy very much like object orientation. An informatics lab, like I said, is very similar. And so here I have an informatics lab for every informatics team. Typically they have around maybe five individuals working in these, uh, and these can grow and, and be added as needed. And again, I just apply a simple policy template that's different. The function is a little bit different, 
in informatics labs, you make uh, you know, some of the compiled applications available. We wouldn't necessarily do that in tech lab. And certainly, I mentioned we have different control, so the policy pattern is different. Where we spend most of our time, uh, and they're very cookie cutter, but it's the vast majority of our accounts is these applications and services accounts. And here, we'll give a separate account for every discrete workload. So product A, for example, uh, is some application. And so we will give it a dev, a test, and a prod. We'll give three different accounts to that team building that product. And the, um, the dev environment, the, the separation of these environments, they don't have to be separate, but almost always they are, is really powerful. So you can imagine you want to run some automation that says, uh, let's run dev 8 by 5. If I can, I can run that uniquely in the dev account, I don't even run it in the prod account. And so I don't have to worry that maybe something's mistagged or that is a bug in the, in the uh, script that's going to start sh turning off and shutting down instances uh, because I made some mistake, because the environments are separate. It costs almost nothing to have a separate account. So I can just get that separation, and I get this uh, goodness here. Uh, similarly, uh, we get the separate cost management. So let's say I'm looking at dev and prod, and they cost the same. Well, you're going to, you know, the team who understands their workload is now looking at their cost, and they can optimize that, and they can recognize that, well, dev probably shouldn't be the same as prod. Maybe I should only run it 8 by 5 or something less. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, another big aspect is the access control. Let's say you have um, a small number of users in prod that are going to have high privileged access, and everyone else might be read-only, or even a totally different team running prod if you want. But I can give super user access to everybody and their friend in dev and not, not be a problem. And one more example would be uh, product B on the right there. Uh, if you have a pure serverless application uh, or, or a single page web app, then there really is no need to have separate environments. You can put those in one account. So we accommodate that. It's just most of the time it makes sense to separate them. Then distributed computing. Uh, again, the functional difference here is usually it's run by a scheduler. Uh, there's a large IP space, which is uncharacteristic and different from, the, let's say, a tech lab, which doesn't need a large IP space. And then this uh, partner collaboration. You know, Amazon created the notion of an account. I mean, it's just sort of it's a natural thing to separate customers from each other. That's a pretty firm boundary. Well, if we're going to do a collaboration, all the parties also have to trust us. Sorry about that. All the parties have to trust us that we're going to keep everybody separate and controlled. So we allocate a new account for every partner collaboration. And we can set up the policies and framework for what a partner collaboration looks like. Again, it's that template of those accounts. So we have one recent example, which is really exciting. It's a three-party collaboration, uh, which is a little bit more challenging than the simple two-body problem. And we have uh, two universities and an internal team all bringing staff, data, and algorithms into this environment. They're all bringing that in and all taking some of it out. And so it's a shared, safe DMZ where everyone can work uh, comfortably and, and, and secured and controlled. And of course, there's some, uh, well, some common services. Consolidated billing, I mentioned we have this billing information at the individual account level. But of course, you can aggregate that up into a consolidated billing account. So I have a single PO against all these uh, many, many accounts. And again, networking, we have several direct connects. We bring those into a common account that the NetOps team can manage. And those are VPC peered out to the uh, rest of the accounts. And I mentioned earlier that we were shy at first about leaning into a multi-account strategy, even though we kind of wanted to. And then once we decide to, of course, this is where that lives. We have an account that runs our automated guardrails. It's sort of, I like to think of it as like the for loop that goes across all accounts and says, what kind of account are you and what, is, what policies should you get? Both the policy template as well as inherited uh, variants for your unique um, instance of, of, that, um, of that template. And so uh, that's where that happens in this automated guardrails account is uh, oversees and manages and makes sure that everyone stays in control and compliance. And we actually started to build this ourselves, because that was that pivot that we made, which helped us appreciate the problem uh, and understand it, and then recognize that it actually is a very big problem, which is obviously why we're scared from it at the beginning. Um, and Amazon gives you lots of capabilities to do that. We built a bunch, and then recognized that this was, for us at least, uh, much more of a buy and then a build decision. And so that's when we bring in uh, Turbot, who uh, is the tool that we use that actually runs those automated guardrails uh, and keeps our environment safe now. So what we're trying to do is use this account um, as, a, as a container sort of uh, model. 
to build a virtue cycle where I have multiple accounts, lets me give teams high autonomy and enablement, and that lets them be highly agile and innovative and keep up with this dynamic need uh, that we have to be able to uh, adapt to the science very quickly in order to accelerate drug discovery, which is our mission. But the activation energy to enable that is this automation. And so that's where we have that automation that helps us allow this goodness that's on the right side of the picture there. And um, to explain what that actually looks like, other than so the, um, what I've described, how uh, Nathan from Turbot will come up and explain a little bit more how Turbot actually does that. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. So what was really interesting about working with Ken and the team at Novartis was that they realized something really early that actually takes many of our customers um, a long time to realize, and that's that power has completely shifted from the infrastructure team to the app teams. The cloud moves infrastructure to the app. And what that means is that basically now we have to move to a world where we think about that infrastructure being controlled in real time by the software that's working within it. If you have a single manual process, you're dead in the water. If you think you can review something or do it for them, you've just killed the agility of the cloud. You have to think about it in a different way. Ken and team were able to see that very, very early, and that led them to some conclusions like multi-account, et cetera, that got them moving. Now, as we think about how to automate out our compliance controls for the cloud, the key there is to have a philosophy about how we're thinking about that. We want to give agility to those teams to our app teams. We need researchers to be able to do research without being stopped. We need web teams to be able to move quickly. We need GXP teams to be able to move as slowly as they would like, right? <laughs> but we don't want that slowest common denominator to no longer to take over the whole organization. That's traditionally what we did, right? We'd put the biggest apps in there. They move the slowest. We'd have shared resources and have everybody moving that way. So we have to rethink all of that in the world of cloud when we now have the ability for those applications to manage their own infrastructure. So at Turbot, as we've worked with lots of life sciences companies, financial companies, et cetera, to do this, we've got a few lessons I'm going to share with you now, and then we'll talk a bit about how that can all come together to give you a framework for automation, guardrails, which enables that sort of agility. So the first one that Ken spoke about a bit was that multi-account model. We think of it as a lot as workload isolation. Right? Accounts are beautiful, hard blast radius to create that isolation. But even more importantly, we're in a world now with cloud where we can actually isolate entirely our applications on a networking level. Remember the days we had a physical server, then someone had a brainchild, let's create VMs, and now we're all excited for containers. It's the same thing. Applications now live in their own virtual data centers. We're completely isolating them out. That's technically interesting, but what's really exciting is it means that each application is now responsible for its own change control. We can kill the cab, right? We can kill those slow choke points that normally bring our organization down, right? So creating that isolation gives us safety, you know, all the benefits Ken mentioned, but it also allows us to work independently from each other. Now, the other part about cloud that changes completely how we have to think about our automations is that there is no way we can compete with it. If you're a central cloud team, you are not going to compete with Amazon. A thousand new features a year. If you're trying to choke those out or compete with them or build your own, you're going to come to reInvent very, very nervous every year about all the things you're about to have to do when you get back. But instead, if you can think about a way to enable your teams to use all these amazing capabilities, queues, you know, Lambda, whatever those things are, and work out how to enable those services for those teams, all of a sudden you're turning that speed of cloud that was scary if you were an infrastructure team previously to be an advantage. Right, because now you're starting to ride that rocket and turn it into something that you can use as an organization. So the next part of thinking about automation is not to abstract it. If we abstract these tools, we now have to keep up with them. If we build a new interface to creating an S3 bucket, we have to move as fast as the change of S3. Right? Even if we require people to use templates to do that. We have to move as fast as the, the, those things. If you get in the way, you are the bottleneck. And you do not want to be the bottleneck when you've got all these teams getting excited at conferences like this one. The second thing that happens once you start riding that rocket is that you can, all of a sudden, tutorials are plentiful. Google search results work to your advantage. You know, instead of training everybody and in your in internal processes for how to do things and find things, you can now use all of that to your advantage in that environment. That then changes the relationship we have between our cloud team and our application teams. 
Instead of an application team saying, you better do this for me, right? And then having a project manager to chase you, so then you get a project manager to combat their project manager, and then we're running around in a bunch of meetings. Now we're in a world where it's actually like, just do it. Start the server, create the bucket, do what you need to do, and we're now moving with speed. For people who wanted to get stuff done, that's really exciting because they can get stuff done. For people who prefer to chase other people for not, and not getting stuff done, it's a little scary, but you know, it depends who you want in your organization. The other thing is with, of course, even if you felt like you could put a manual process in front of all of that or approve things manually, review JSON files, you know, check encryption policies, good luck doing that in real time once the app starts using those Amazon APIs. Right. Infrastructure is now real time, controlled by the application. If you try to do anything other than work out how to wrap it in software-defined controls, you will quickly fall behind or miss. The nature of that relationship is a complete change from where we used to be. We used to be in a world where it's like, hey, I need this. Well, have you got capital? We go through all that stuff. Now we're in a world where it's like, you're just, the teams are just doing it. You're working with them to help them understand how to tackle it. And then you can feed software into that to make it move faster and faster and faster. Of course, once you've got this set up where you've got people now with the freedom to do things they want to do, we quickly hit the point where it's, whoa, that's a bit too much, right? So I'm very happy for anyone to create as many S3 buckets as they'd like and store as much data in as they'd like. We just send them the bill. It's their business unit, it's their bill, et cetera. But it better be encrypted. I want logging of all access to that environment, right? And there are other rules you might start to set. These are the policies or the controls you want to wrap those teams in to make sure you're keeping that environment safe. You have to think very carefully about what are your must rules versus your should rules. You must use encryption. You must have logging. You, know, you should use this region, or maybe you must use this region. It's up to you. So as you're thinking about your automation, quickly get to the point where you're thinking about the policies and the rules you want to wrap. This is no longer a world of discussions and grays. This is a world of real-time automated action. If you don't know what your automated action is, if you don't know what your opinion is, you can't write the software. Right, you can't make those controls work. Now, as you get those policies flowing, all of a sudden you start to create VPCs with subnets, and then you go, oh, what are we going to name them, and what's the route tables, and what's our best practice around that gateway? Should they be high availability? You know, just to talk networking for a moment. You're going to have hundreds and hundreds of these policies and decisions as you move through in time. Be ready for that. Start building them slowly and gradually as you think about those problems for your organization. Right. Most of them have been solved before, so there's lots of good advice out there. You can map to NIST, you can map to CIS, you can do that sort of thing. But you're going to have hundreds of decisions that were previously in SOPs, SOWs, oh, Bob who works down there, you know, always did it that way. Right, that's the organizational knowledge that's now wrapped up in software. And of course, the other thing is, because we're large complex enterprises, particularly in life sciences, there's going to be exceptions, a lot of exceptions. Everything in S3 must be encrypted. We're all happy with that. Oh, but we're doing a public website. OK, I can't encrypt that one. Right, and you're going to end up with a lot of exceptions. So be prepared for that. Think about how you're going to tackle that in your environment and how you're going to manage those, control those, time them out, that sort of thing. We like to think about policies like this. We try to keep it really simple, similar to the way RFCs are written. You know, you must, you know, Amazon Route 53 must be disabled everywhere. No one can use it except for maybe the DNS team. Right? must, should, simple rules, and have a scope for those rules or exceptions. Now, once you've got your cloud team there setting some rules and some policies in conjunction with security, and you've got application teams actually doing interesting things, researchers starting to do great stuff, we're now in a cycle where we actually can learn by doing. We're no longer pointing our fingers at each other trying to get it done. We're now in a place where it's like, I need to use this. What tool can I use? Right? The cloud team might be experts in how to do that to accelerate each of the teams, while the application teams know their business area the best. And we've changed the relationship from one of request fulfill pointing to one of how are we going to do this together? Can we create a policy exception while we work this out? Right? Which is generally a pretty reasonable question that security would be happy with. Right? So you can start to change that relationship and allow people to experiment within that really tight blast radius you've set up within a set of policies you've defined, right, and exceptions that you're willing to make to those rules. 
And that gives you a large collaboration pattern and it allows you to really start to realign the way your infrastructure teams and your application teams and your researchers are working together makes it much, much more collaborative. And so that cycle then becomes, oh, I need to use queuing. Okay, we get better at queuing. The next team can benefit from that and around and around we go. Once we have all those policies and those different parts brought together, we're suddenly in a place where we can implement real-time guardrails. This is the critical part. Checking is good, but Detecting a problem and instantly correcting it is better. We need to be in a place where we know we're in control of our environment all the time, not at the point when we did audit a month ago, right? but all the time. Every S3 bucket now that exists previously, now and in the future must be encrypted, and I want to ensure that in real time. If you're going to let your users use the Amazon console, use CloudFormation, use Terraform, use APIs, you've got to have real-time controls. You can review their code, otherwise you're going to have to review every piece of code they write, everything going on in that environment to stay in control. That's not practical, it won't work. But if you can start to set rules on the environment, like if I see an unencrypted bucket, I want to enforce encryption on it, you can now give those teams a lot of freedom and you no longer have to review all those projects on the way in. Reduces your workload, allows you to focus more on the new services, and now we're in a virtuous cycle. The basic pattern for a guardrail is quite simple. You're going to wire up things like AWS events in CloudWatch or watch your cloud trail, it's up to you. Bring those events together from the different regions and accounts and consolidate them into a single place. You can roll out a thousand Lambda functions if you'd prefer, right? or you can start to bring them together. But the key is you want to get them to a place where you have context about how to make your decisions, where you know what your policies are and how you want to treat that bucket in that environment or that EC2 server in that environment. So you need to combine that event with the context so you can make a good decision. And that's when the guardrail comes into play to actually implement the change you want in that environment. Turn on encryption, delete the server because it's in an invalid place, whatever those actions are you want to take. Audit, tra audit trail out those capabilities, report what's going on back to the users, right? And you're in that for loop that Ken mentioned, right? I can see an action happened. I know what I want it to be take a response to that, that creates a new action, which I can then go, and we're going around and around, right? Once we create this loop, we allow console, we allow API access, we have all of those different capabilities ready to go. Now, as you're thinking about your automation, it's one thing to create guardrails and patterns on people and to say, no, you can't do that, I can automatically fix that. But what you really want to do is start helping them move faster. We live together in an enterprise for the whole point of working together and moving faster, so occasionally we need to do that, right? So basically what we do is we start to think about how can we create common language and models for these teams? If I'm talking IAM, I want to talk about read-only versus operator versus admin. I don't want to talk custom JSON policy because I can have much higher bandwidth conversations with you. When I'm talking networking, I want to talk private network, isolated network, public facing, DMZ, you know, internal facing but with direct internet access. I want patterns that I can talk about. And then when I'm in a security view, I'm like, yeah, my application has two DMZ subnets combined with two private subnets, and we all know what that is. And with automation, we know it's in control. Common language and those patterns give us very high bandwidth conversations, and they allow us to roll out faster and faster as an organization as we learn. This is an example for IAM. Define your levels. Metadata access means no reading, read only, operator, standard common language that we can all start to understand and use faster and faster. Of course, once you've got all this moving on, an app's creating something in the environment, spinning up 26 servers in an EMR environment, then we're automatically responding to each of those, tagging them, you know, turning on whatever policies you want and making sure encryption's there, et cetera. We have a fast moving infrastructure controlled environment, and what we want to do now is know what the hell happened for audit trail security purposes, but also for our own application and development teams who just need to see what's happening in that environment. So we need high visibility to that environment of what actually happened and the change history of that. We basically almost need like a diff like we had in our code to see what happened over time to our configuration in our environment. So think about the visibility and how you're giving that back to the users as you automate out these tools. Otherwise, they'll be confused and asking you, a million questions. 
Once we've got those pieces together, we're really in a world of automation. We love to think about and talk about killing the ticket. If you see a ticket, you should be able to automate a response to it. If not, you haven't defined the world problem well enough yet. Once you automate that response, you should never see that ticket again. We are automating out level one and level two. Anything that can be scripted for a human to handle can be automated out. And anything that can't be scripted for a human to handle should go to the app team, probably. So we can rapidly you know, move through our automation. And once we get those pieces together, we start to end up in a world of software-defined operations. Our software-defined infrastructure has software-defined operations to help manage it. It moves in real time. It adjusts with it at that pace. So what I was going to do was take an attempt to show you real quick what that actually can look like as it all comes together. So this is an example of a Turbot environment which implements a number of automated guardrails. You log in using Active Directory, that sort of thing, to be able to see in the environment how that you, so you have that level of control. Users then see the Amazon accounts they have access to. They're two out of hundreds, right? Or they're three, right? Each person can see their scope of the environment. They can log in that, see things like their billing, et cetera, immediately. What's more important, though, is the fact that they can immediately go to that Amazon console. They are not abstracted from those tools. We want them using that native and direct access in this type of environment. Now, let's say they go to something like an S3 and do a very simple action, like creating a bucket. Find down now. There it is. Apologies. So we create a bucket. As soon as we do that in this environment, because we have automated real-time controls associated with it, if we come and watch the properties on this bucket for a moment, we'll start to see over the next few seconds those policies take effect in the environment. We saw the tags start to get picked up. S3 returning slightly different results there. So when you look at the tags now, it's automatically picked up the tags to the environment and started to set those on that bucket. Refresh again, we can see now it's turned on the access logging for that bucket, a real-time control in response to a policy. Right? It's also done things like, say, you can't delete that or turn that off. Right? You're starting to give people the ability to create buckets, set up best practices, while giving them appropriate amount of control while letting them have a lot of freedom and access in that environment. As we do that, we also do things like, for example, bucket policy permissions, enforce encryption in transit. Right? Real-time policies done as detective and corrective actions in response to an action they took in the console. If we come back to Turbot, we can see that we've detected the fact that that new S3 bucket's been created. We start to create a history of that action and that capability there for what happened with that bucket. So we can see the controls here for this bucket. For example, the encryption in transit control, the tags have been set. We can look at that control and see the event that triggered it. This is the visibility I'm talking about, letting people see the events that led to the actions in that environment so they know how things were done and why they were done. That raised an alarm, which created an automated action, which then automatically closed the alarm. Visibility into a real-time control operating in the environment. The decisions we're making there are tied to the policies which I mentioned. The idea that you can set those simple policies in your world to determine how you want things to work. For example, you might say, in this case, this bucket really needs to have versioning turned on. Let's enforce versioning. That's now a real-time enforced guardrail that will constantly ensure versioning's on, on that bucket. When you're managing your policies, you need to think about exceptions. Think about ways that you can see all the exceptions in the environment to a policy. So here the policy is I don't care about versioning except for these buckets. You might use version control to manage these. You might use an Excel spreadsheet. It's up to you. But you're going to have a lot of exceptions you need to think about in your environment and how you want to manage those is important. If we come back to the S3 console, refresh there, we should see things like, for example, the versioning has been turned on as a result of that change, et cetera. Now, 
back in the Amazon, back in the Turbo console, we can actually start to see the history of change to that bucket, and we can start to find resources throughout the whole environment. So for example, the bucket we just created, we can see it there. We can see its activity history, right, from when it was created, all the alarm changing, et cetera. We can see the history of configuration change to that bucket. It was created by Nathan. It was changed by Turbot to add policies to it, add tagging to it. We then made a change to add the encryption. Turbot did that as an automatic guardrail, right, and it also turned on the versioning. So you're starting to get that history of change in that sort of environment in response to those guardrail rules that you've set. It's worth thinking about how you want to find resources for that sort of stuff. So search could also be for things like IP addresses or understanding the different parts of your environment, whether it's to find an EC2 server with a certain IP, right, or an IP range, right? So you can really start to cut through that environment and help you troubleshoot and see visibly what's happening with everything you've got going on in there. I mentioned one of the things that's really important to think about is that permission structure. Having a common language which to talk. So if we can grant by searching for someone from our directory and then thinking about whether they have you know, S3, admin, metadata, read-only, or operator, this is a much simpler conversation than talking about detailed JSON objects. Right? If we simplify that to make sure it's always the same, again, common language drastically accelerates our conversation. Right? Now, once you've implemented those pieces, what you then want to do, of course, is make sure that they can understand that in the console as well so that you have that full native control all the way through. This is not an abstraction, it's an implementation. So if we look at the groups, we can see they map immediately to those same things we saw in the other console. Right, so we're looking for that type of common language patterns that are deployed at scale, right, with real-time action and control through that environment. So software-defined operations is really about trying to give you that visibility, as we mentioned, combined with those different pieces. Now, for strategy nerds out there, you'll notice this is an activity system, as Michael Porter would describe it. And effectively, what we've just done with those decisions we took on the way through, I need to isolate my workloads so that I can implement different rockets in each one. I can combine them by teaching people how to work inside them and implement those patterns at scale. Right. That gives us a powerful set of things that all work together to allow our application teams to move faster and faster while we implement controls around them. I'll hand over to Ken and tell him where Novartis has got to. Thanks, Nathan. So basically, you can see now you got a little bit more feel for um, like what the Turbot console looks like and the way those controls sort of automatically happen, basically how I sleep at night, right? Because once you set it up, the machine is doing the work for you. It makes life easy. So let's now shift a little bit from the how to where has it got us. So you can see here, this is where we are today uh, in Niver. Uh, this particular model, after our pivot and really start to deploy um, actual workloads in this environment is not much over a year old now. Uh, and this is part of our cloud first for new workload strategy. So uh, everything we do in Niber now uh, is cloud first, uh, but we still have a lot of legacy. We'll migrate eventually. We've done some migrations uh, opportunistically. But most of these numbers here represent what we've done just really within the last year. So we now have hundreds of users that have that direct console access, the Turbot access, and through that also the, the Amazon console access, which is incredibly empowering. Uh, and then we have, you see, what, 170 accounts and growing at a pretty good clip. And we think that that's probably going to plateau around 500, just to give you an order of magnitude feel for that. Um, so that just kind of gives a bit of scale. So of course, we're doing this for a purpose. Right? Our mission is to accelerate the science to help patients. And so let me tell you about just two examples. So multi-parametric data analysis is an application that we had doing high throughput screening, high content screening analysis on-prem. Uh, it was a rich application, used a lot of internal infrastructure, and was at the limit of what it could do. It really couldn't grow any further. And that was bad enough. And then basically, the science came back and said, well-level analysis is great, 
but really we need to do cell level analysis, which is scientifically much more valid, and that's now going to increase uh, the scope of the amount of data that we're processing uh, three, three and a half orders of magnitude, because now every well has got a few thousand cells in it. And so the team, uh, we basically allocated these dev, test, and product counts to this team. They re-architected the application to be cloud native, uh, wrote a bunch of cloud formation, and they were empowered to just operate and do, uh, and, and rebuild uh, MPDA uh, into this uh, uh, cloud environment. And you can see we're processing, you know, per screen, uh, you could have trillions of observations depending on how many uh, uh, plates are in the screen. So this is really exciting. What's scary and even more exciting is within the next year or so, there is serious conversation about we actually want to do time series. So for every plate, we take an image of a plate of 1536 wells, we actually want to do time series of perhaps 100 images over time. So now we've got two more orders of magnitude. Oh, and by the way, we also would like to do Z stacks, so 10 images in the Z focal plane, which is now another factor of 10. So we're talking another three orders of magnitude that we're looking at adding within the next year, year and a half, and that's on top of what we already did. So in a two-year span, we're talking about six, six and a half orders of magnitude increase in data volume from, from screening technologies, which is really quite insane, and we re that's a good example of why we really need to be able to react to these things. So this next example is the informatics lab example. I'll show this in the form of a timeline. So back in July, UK Biobank released half a million genomes with the associated health records, which was an amazing and useful thing. Then the NEAR lab took that data, and they did a genome-wide association study, and they published that out publicly, and they did that very quickly. Then this just last October, uh, what, just over a month now, the M lab takes the NEAR lab data, they add transcriptome information to that to produce an even richer data set, and they publish that publicly on S3. And that's where our story within NIBRA begins. We have an informatician who's watching this and sees and thinks, that's some really important data. I could do something with that. He already has access to an informatics lab account. So basically, in a day, he downloads the data set uh, from his S3 into ours and then reformats it into a way that'll be uh, easier to process in Spark. Shortly after that, he's published, uh, th we've done some preliminary analysis in the notebook. We then, a couple of days after, we've got um, a bunch of informaticians with a notebook application that's published accessing this data, which is now formatted and processed nicely. And by October 25th, we've already done enough analysis that we've taken a set of gene targets for about a dozen different diseases, and we've distributed that to the drug discovery teams within NIBR to start looking at those, uh, those, in, those indications with those targets. It's an elapsed time of nine days. This informatician didn't have to go and ask for a provisioning request. He didn't need us to build anything. He had a lab. He had a bench, and he went out, and it just happens to be a dry bench, and he went out and did some really exciting analysis, and it's a good example of what we're trying to do with our architecture and with our cloud team and just the way we operate, is we want to enable our users and get out of the way. Let the science happen at the pace that science can happen. So these guys are brilliant people, uh, but hopefully the environment made it easy for them to leverage that. There's some other aspects of the way we've done things that had a little bit of surprising uh, outcomes. We knew that moving to the cloud in a big way was going to be uh, important to the organization and be well received. The way we did it was a little bit surprising in the reception we got. And you can see some of the excerpts of some emails that I get uh, because this it really energized the, and invigorated our engineers and the informaticians and everyone's using this environment because of the empowerment model is something people are very thirsty for. And it, changed the way that people did the change, where we did the change management, the way people had, uh, accepted the move to the cloud uh, in a very um, uh, rich sort of way. Uh, and they were highly productive, and people started doing side projects. And it just was a surprising sort of enabler that we just got more results than we expected. Of course, automation has efficiency benefits. We have um, some great internal teams, cybersecurity, the information governance, and network operations in particular, and others all helped. But the core cloud team 
of four people that manage those 170 accounts and those 400 users, and that's going to keep on growing. And of course, we have one big TBH who has not been pulling their weight. Um, but we've got four people operating all of that, which is a testament to the ability of just automation in general, but our ability to shift to a model where instead of dealing with this sort of order n problem, we can go to an order six problem and just come up with six templates, essentially. That's a little bit oversimplified, but you get the idea that we apply a template and let automation do all this work. We define those policies that, like Nathan was showing, and then we can just let the machine do the work. We don't need to have people in the loop. So I've covered some of these tips and lessons learned and, and observations uh, along the way, but I have some others on this list here that I haven't been able to touch on. And I've, I'm somewhat long-winded, if you didn't notice. And I really want to go through all of these and tell you all about this stuff and realize there's no way we're going to fit that in. It's a whole other talk. So what I did, I've, I, um, I did a blog post on this. And so if you go to that link, uh, kenrobbins.link slash reinvent, it sends you straight to the particular post where I basically just expanded on what these bullet points are. We can also talk about them during um, Q&A if we have any time left, uh, or certainly grab me or Nathan afterwards. We can talk about these as well. It'd be great. So basically, the, the big take home here is if you're in an environment that has the same sort of high rate of change, high diversity that we have, we found that the multi-account model is really powerful and that account as a container is enabling our users in a, in a, a significant way. Uh, but in order to do that, you really need the automation. Right? You can't just let that happen. So if you have the, uh, that model and you automate it so that you can keep the control, then you actually can enable this high innovation, high agility, and reactive nature to the needs of the, of the organization and the science and still not give up, but maintain even better control, real-time control, compliance, monitoring, security. Uh, it's actually better than anything we've done otherwise. Uh, so we get not only can we keep up with it, but we can do it even better this way. And finally, I'd like to thank inside NIBR. We have, like I mentioned, some of the teams. There's some more teams here. Great collaborations from uh, many different participants across the organization. Uh, but also, Turbot and Amazon are essentially are surrogate members of our team. So I'd like to thank them as well for all their support to build this environment with us. And with that, I think we have time for maybe a few questions. And thanks, everyone, for your attention today. And Nathan and I can, uh, we'll see what we can do. Thank you.